G'day everyone, welcome to this update for Australian and global stock markets for the 12th of July. Uh, and it was another very volatile week with uh, everyone focused uh, on Greece and also uh, very much on China with uh, that extraordinary volatility in the China market continuing. So uh, there was a fairly good rally into the end of the week. I'm not sure what it all means because this is really a day-by-day -day proposition with respect to uh, debt negotiations with Greece and uh, also just how the Chinese stock market's going to behave. So it's uh, pretty difficult at the moment to actually be confident about uh, you know one day or, or one week to the next. So let's have a look at... Um, at some of the action for last week. So uh, the China market uh, crashed as everybody knows and then it bounced back quite strongly. And all you've got, to, all you can say really is that this is not a free market. I mean, it's just insane that um, they're trying to foster a free market and, uh, and enter the, the global financial community and yet uh, they suspend half the stock market, uh, direct state-owned companies and, um, and various other uh, government controlled entities to basically buy stocks and to try and attain a certain level. So my view is that the suspensions, uh, which could stay in place for up to six months, means that uh, this is not going to work itself out uh, quickly. There's, there's a lot of people who've borrowed money on margin and uh, who want to get out of the stocks they're in and they can't do so for six months. Um, I doubt they're going to they're going to be a significant change of mind over the next six months. So this is not something that's going to go away very quickly. So overall, the China market, incredibly unpredictable. Uh, and we've just seen that massive volatility in the space of uh, about 10 days. And uh, it's really, it's it's probably going to continue. Well, I have to say there was certainly evidence of uh, substantial international money coming back into um, this China stock market towards the end of the week. Now, on the other hand, um, Europe looking much calmer. Um, we'll know the outcome of uh, the ECB deliberations uh, later today. Uh, but look, I think contagion is most unlikely to happen. No one really wants Greece to exit the Eurozone. Um, the amazing thing is that, that Greece has now gone back with effectively the deal that the ECB put to them about two months ago, which they rejected. Uh, it was then rejected again at the referendum, uh, and yet Greece's government has now gone back with that. Um, whether the Greek people accept it or not, I don't know. But look, my, my gut feeling is that something will get sorted out here, and, uh, and Europe is in a much better place than it was in 2008 um, and even in 2011. So I, I don't think uh, there's going to be any significant problems, certainly not to the same extent that China could be. So I think we'll see Greece fade uh, from importance over uh, over coming months. Turning out of the American market, the S&P index uh, was exactly flat on the week, uh, but getting more volatile, as we'll see from the chart, more uh, bigger daily ranges. Uh, the key levels uh, for a, a trend change, uh, we'll have a look at the monthly chart, which removes you know a lot of the day-to-day uh, noise of the market, the you know the backwards and forwards that don't really mean much. So we'll look at some key levels for a trend change there. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, I think the American economy is in reasonable shape, certainly better than most. Um, and I remain comfortable with the market. Um, so I, I think you still need to, it's still very much a stock pickers market. Um, but the fundamentals of the of the companies and and the American economy, I think, is is okay. <clears throat> and I think the most important thing is that the precursors to a major decline are not in sight. And uh, you know, members know exactly what I'm talking about. There are there are three key things that uh, have to be in place basically by definition before you get a market crash. And um, and none of those things are in place. Uh, and I'm talking a sustained bear market here. Yes, you can get a very short-term um, excursion to the downside, but then a, you know, a quick rebound. But I'm talking about a bear market that might last six to 18 months. Um, those precursors are just not in sight. The Aussie stock market, I'll first of all look at the Aussie dollar. Uh, it's broken its trading range, uh, which is significant been in that 75 to 81 trading range, it broke that and, and held below that level. 
And I think importantly, it failed to rebound into the end of the week when commodities uh, came back uh, and China's stock market came back. Uh, it failed to rebound back above 75. I think that's significant. So I think next stop for the Aussie dollar is uh, probably around 72 cents, and then we could break below 70 uh, before the year is out. Now, the ASX 200 index lost 46 points on the week. We'll have a look at that chart in a minute. And I think events in China, no matter how they play out, they bode quite badly for our economy and our stock market. And the reason that I say that is that some of the measures taken in China uh, really smacked the desperation in the last uh, couple of weeks on the part of the government. So you've got to start thinking, you know, what is it they don't know that um, that we, you know, that could unfold in the next uh, in the next few months. So I think that's a considerable worry. And of course, if China runs into economic difficulties, then that has a, a massive effect on our economy, far more so than America. So, uh, you know, potentially this is uh, this is bad news for our economy and, and therefore for our stock market, which is, it's still not cheap. Our stock market is still, uh, you know, reasonably fully valued, in some cases still overvalued. But I think irrespective of what happens in China, whether they manage to squeak through this market uh, crash or not, I think China is destined for slow growth uh, and they're going to become a more services intensive economy and therefore a more commodity light economy. So probably a lower demand for, for commodities. So uh, I think those things are already in place and irreversible. So we'll just have to wait and see how that uh, pans out. Now, let's have a look at um, the S&P 500 index. This is the monthly chart, first of all. Now, you can see there is a pretty clear support line here. Let me just get a hold of, of that line. So that's a now this is a very big picture being monthly. So you're looking here at, uh, at about 15 years worth of price history. So we if we are to going to get a trend change, there's a key level, I would say around about the 2000 mark. So if, if the S&P gets down to about 2000 and closes below that, then that would break a, a trend line that's been in place now since October 2011. And you could probably extend that all the way back to, to the end of the GFC. So that would be a significant event around 2000. So that's an important level. The other line on this chart is this blue moving average line, which is a, a 12 month moving average. And again, you can see it hasn't been breached since the upheaval that we got in 2011. So again, that would be significant. We got a, a minor breach here in October last year, but you can see it, it rebounded very quickly and finished out the month. So uh, the month of July, I think is important, uh, July and possibly August. If we get a close below that line, or if we get a close below this trend line, then you know we could be into a different situation, but I just can't see it justified by the economics or the or the corporate fundamentals. Let's look at the daily chart. You can see uh, more significant volatility. We had a really big range day here on the 29th of June, big down day. Uh, we had another really big range day on the 7th of July and the 8th of July, and then the 10th of July. So very very significant volatility picked up in the U.S. market. Earnings season has just commenced in the US, so that will also be important in terms of determining uh, the, the near term for stocks. Let's look now at the, uh, the Aussie index. You can see the Australian ASX 200 is in a clear downtrend uh, and a downturn channel. So no question about that. And, uh, you know, the, the continued talk about the Australian market getting to 6,000 points, I don't know. I just can't fathom how how people can still think when they look at when they look at the technical charts and when they look at the fundamentals how 6,000 points is a reality and especially with what's going on in China at the moment and the headwinds for our banks uh, I just can't see that it's going to happen turning now to uh, gold we'll just look at gold on a weekly chart nothing has changed it's still just stuck in this uh, in this overall range and finally the Australian dollar we're in this uh, channel between 70, say 75.8 and around 81. We dropped out of the bottom of that channel during the week. 
and failed to rebound, uh, despite the fact that uh, there were certainly some circumstances that could have dictated that. So let's go back to uh, to the next uh, step in it. Commodities, gold lower by $4 for the week. It really was a perfect environment for a rally, but it didn't. Um, you know, with all of the events in Europe and China, uh, it was just right for, for gold to really, you know, stack on 50 or, or $100 an ounce, but it didn't do it. And I think that's a really poor indicator for the fortunes of gold uh, as things stand at the moment. Uh, now, when, when looking at more general commodities, um, iron ore, uh, copper, oil, um, we're, we're in a supply overhang that's got many years to run yet, I believe. So there's more supply than demand. And this is at the same time as Chinese demand or as Chinese demand growth is failing. I don't know that their demand is necessarily going backwards, but certainly their growth in demand is slowing and therefore um, we've got supply increasing, particularly in, in uh, iron ore. So not a good combination. Copper finished uh, fairly weakly at 251, uh, and that's really just confirmation of where we are in terms of the global growth story. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to have low growth, low interest rates for a long period of time to come. Crude oil got belted, I've been saying, for weeks and weeks and weeks when uh, crude was above $60 that it would, it would have to come off, and it did, and I still think there's further falls yet. So the price action in crude oil, quite bearish. There's the uh, spot copper chart for the last six months. Not a lot of change in the week, but you can see it's definitely gone into a quite a sharp downtrend. So just to wrap it all up, look, markets may keep rebounding. China may continue to rebound uh, under this, um, this completely artificial stimulus from, from their central bank. Uh, but look, it's, it's just a day-by-day -day proposition, and it's very, very dangerous. So when there is short-term significant volatility, and I put this slide up last week, it's critical to do a couple of things. Just stay with the highest quality assets that you can find. Um, determine what price it is that, that is acceptable to you and let the market come to you. Don't chase prices. And, uh, and probably most importantly and most uh, the difficult thing to do in this sort of environment is to actually have the courage to pull the trigger when there's a market sell-off. You've got to be very confident about the quality of the assets that you're buying, and you've got to be very confident about the, the price that you're buying them at, that it's going to be somewhere near a low point. Um, and that's the hardest thing, unless you're extremely experienced. And, and as members know, that's what I spend a lot of time helping members to, uh, to do. So uh, for uh, anyone outside of the Specialist Share Education membership, there's my contact details. Would love to hear from you. That's it for this week. Cheers.